Greetings, everyone. Don't forget to go out and vote on November 8th. And if you're going to vote a straight party ticket, remember that that does not include your selections for school board candidates. So you're going to want to move to the back of the ticket and make those selections. And also, you have three selections to make. Uh, so don't forget District 1, 2, and 3. So remember that and uh, vote your conscience. In your Carmel current piece that you three developed, you rightly point out that in the past decade that there has been this seismic shift in philosophy in the eyes of school administrators. And this, it, I saw it. I saw it at school board meetings that they feel like parents have become the obstacles in education instead of ingrained partners. So my next question is gonna focus on parental involvement and engagement because this is a hot button for many parents in our community. Um, I, I've recently heard from a really wonderful, brilliant retired teacher that in order for students to succeed, the board, the administration and teachers must view the stakeholders you know, through a triangle where the top of the triangle is the child and the two supporting bases are the parents and the teachers. And I, I love this description because it shows that the parents and the teacher are working together to support the child for success. And over the last three years, we have seen that the CCS board and administration, they, they lock parents out of schools, they change policies to censor and inhibit free speech, and they've implemented a recent policy to keep parents and grandparents out of the lunchroom. We even saw Jennifer Nelson Williams, who's running again on the ticket with her two candidates. I'm trying to remember Kukla, and I'm trying to remember the other candidate that she's running with, you know, so they must agree with that, you know, to lock parents and grandparents out of the lunchrooms. So recently at a school board meeting, the board and the administration even proposed adding classes to the course offerings at the high school. And to add these classes, there was no data to even support the need. And at no time were parents mentioned as part of the decision-making process to add the classes. And as one final point, I just read in the Hamilton County Reporter, a parent write in and actually go through a methodical explanation of how she and many others tried to write to the Carmel Clay Board and to the superintendent to request the content of who was on the diversity, equity, and inclusion and the social emotional learning committees and what the content was of those meetings. And she was re repeatedly ramrodded and told that she could not get the names of the content of what was going on in those discussions. So I guess what I'm asking is, how will each of you support policies that involve and engage parents in Carmel to enable students to thrive? Mm -hmm. Well, I, we've seen that uh, too, as you have too in those school board meetings and um, some of the presentations. And um, we think that's where kind of the heart of the problem is. And, and what I think motivated us to really get involved is there has been sort of a, um, a brokenness between parents and their input and the school and the teachers. It seems like that, that school board is that middle level and they've just not, they've just not allowed it. Um, don't know why, um, there is some secrecy. Don't think that's good. Um, there needs to be really a healthy balance. Uh, parents, we need to encourage parents to get involved where maybe some have just, I think when my kids were involved, I, you know, I probably kind of pushed away and said like, they've got that handle. I don't need to go to school board meetings, yeah. but for such a time as this, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. Parents yeah. need to have an active input because their kids are, are being taught some things that probably wouldn't align with their family family values. So I know as, as school board members, we can really um, look at existing policies 
to see that are, are we following those policies or, or have we veered off? And if not, do we need to make better policies to ensure that parents have an active voice in their kids' education? Um, simple as that. Yeah. I'm going to shift yeah. gears. I've got yeah. this beautiful window gleaming through here, but it's like my the sun is just about to blind me over <laughs> here. Sorry. So I agree with you. I mean, I took that role too because you trusted them, but we're in a different environment now. So it's a great point, Jenny. Parents need to get activated. But even the parents that are getting activated, you know, they're being shut down. Yeah. So so will will each of you, how will you support and engage parents to, to ensure that that there's an open environment, that there's a more transparency. If, if I could just, yeah, I want to uh, amplify what you're saying about that triangle. I think that really is, is what makes it successful when, when there's a collaborative uh, culture between parents and the, the teachers primarily. And that's, this is where the rubber hits the road. It's in the classroom. It's not the administration, it's the classroom. You mentioned that triangle, very simple picture. You got the child at the top, parents and teacher at the bottom and supporting the, 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 the child. If you look at social emotional learning, particularly the, uh, the castle uh, chart, they've got, uh, it, it's, a, it's a way to describe how they envision social emotional learning being uh, uh, a target for the child. And they've got a, a real different, a subtle, but real different perspective it, within, you know, they have the child with all these circles around it, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, et cetera. The first circle around that child is the classroom. The second circle are schools. And the, the next layer out is families and caregivers. So it tells you right there the perspective and the culture that they're, they're bringing in here is the, to me, I see that as the parents being pushed out uh, and the child is being, uh, uh, you know, parented more or less by uh, the, the schools. And I find that really alarming. Okay. So I think what I'm hearing you say is that it's, it's important to acclimate kids that are troubled to an environment that supports them in their time of need, but not to squeeze the parent out to align the parent most closely within that with the teacher to support them in their emotional needs and not to squeeze them out to the third circle. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. All right. And, and and I agree with that. And 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 just to follow on with that, you know, parents were even locked out of board meetings for some of the meetings. They they even couldn't attend board meetings. I mean, I remember there was a time where it was closed session mm -hmm. and we couldn't yeah. even attend, grandparents, citizens, we couldn't even attend board meetings. Would we yeah. have a commitment from you that that would not happen? Yeah, you have a 100% mm -hmm. commitment on that. So Okay, you know, all right, good. One, good. one of our four tenets of the, of the campaign is, is full transparency. And when okay. we say full transparency, we mean full transparency. We mean no more, you know, closed door session meetings where the discussions and the outcomes of those meetings aren't readily made available to the populace, to the public. We mean not limiting comment at board meetings. Um, no, both not limiting it to, to you know, putting a reasonable amount of time to allow somebody to speak. But also, I believe that our citizens have the right to address the people that they hired to do a job and to have a back and forth conversation with those people regarding any issue that, that, that that's of concern to them. And that might mean that we, as prospective board members, are having interactions, public interactions, with folks who don't agree with our perspectives on things. And that's okay. We're happy to hear all perspectives. Um, I think that some of the behavior that we've seen coming from the current board is, for lack of a better word, dismissive. Mm -hmm. I think it, at times, borders on inappropriate. 
um, a mentality of we know better and thus we're not really interested in hearing what others have to say. And I don't think that plays well with folks, especially when it comes to the thing that's most important in their lives, which is their children. You know, we've been, you know, Jenny and Greg and I were just chatting one day and we said, you know, why are, why are we doing this? And we, we kind of joked, we said, well, it's not for the compensation, right? Which I think is like, two, I think it's about 2000 a year. There's some rumors that it's supposed to be increased to 4,000 a year. And it's so much not for the compensation that, that we kind of said, hey, you know what? Let's do it for free. Let's um, if, let's make a pledge that if we are elected, that we'll take that money and donate it back to the school system and the teachers for, for their personal use. And I've been disheartened to see two things. One, the, the amount of activity on social media essentially making fun of that decision and saying, oh, well, that comes down to $7. I saw one guy with a coffee. Oh, thanks. You guys bought me a coffee, right? Because there's some, they, they take the number and they divide it by the number of, of, of teachers and 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 I think they're missing the point there, right? Um, and I've been disheartened to see that our that, that the other folks running haven't come out and made the same pledge. Right. Is it really is the two thousand dollars really that important to you that that that, you, that, that it, it shouldn't just go back to the school system? I mean, we should all be doing this for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's just a different a difference of perspective. Yeah, we believe in, in being completely transparent and, and, and an open book when it comes to the way the board operates, when it comes to the things that the board is, is making decisions upon. And for better or worse, I think the current perception from a lot of our citizens is that the board kind of makes these decisions behind closed doors mm -hmm. and then quickly passes them. You know, Greg and I were at a board meeting recently and they passed a resolution and I literally leaned over to them and whispered like, what did they just vote on? <laughs> You know, there wasn't really any, this is what this is, this is what it represents, this is what it means, this is why we're doing it, and we've decided we're going to pass. It. And I'm sure you saw some of the interviews that we did for the Carmel Education Foundation, but I made this point yeah. there as well, that the very way that the board seems to be operating is that they want to create, even if there is dissenting perspective within the discussions behind closed doors, it's very important to them for, for some reason to, to outwardly and publicly seem unified. I don't think that's why our citizens hire us just to get on board. I think they hire us so that if there is dissenting perspective, they hear that other side of the discussion. And majority rules, that's fine if there's three against two or four against one. But if you if you don't agree with something that, that the board is doing, you don't work for the school system. You don't work for your fellow board members. You work for the citizens of this community who voted to, to hire you to do this, this job. So one thing that, that, that I think we, if we were elected would change from our perspective is, is that, you know, that, that, that perspective as to who we represent and, and, and why we're doing this job. I'm really glad you're saying this. Of all the airports across the nation, Mario Rodriguez, the CEO there, he says, who do we serve? He goes, do we serve airlines or do we serve the people who come through that airport? And he, literally, it's the only airport that says our stakeholder are the people of the community and the people who fly through there. Yeah. It's not the airlines. Every right. other airport says the airlines are our customers. Yeah, our, it's ranked number one. Many and years. that's because it's the number one ranked airport for the last decade. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you're doing the same thing. You're turning it completely upside down and saying, who are our stakeholders? Right. That This is a key fundamental thing, right? Yes. The board has to realize this. Boy, okay, that's really good. Very, very good. Okay, so my next question. As an active citizen and concerned grandparent, I've seen firsthand what kids are being exposed to through these surveys that capture data on non-academic related perceptions, like their views on politics, abortion, transgenderism, <laughs> sex, I mean, the list goes on. Mm -hmm. Further, children are being taught various things in the classroom 
that they may or may not align with their worldviews of their parents. When parents ask administration for these surveys or materials, teachers and administration are reluctant to provide the materials to parents. I have, I have so many questions on this, but my first one is, how will you foster a sense of openness and transparency that allows parents a window into first what's being taught and also implement policies that protect the privacy of that children's information that's being gathered? Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely think there needs to be a standard of even kind of the questions that you ask. I don't know if there is. Some are, are way too personal and intrusive. And I would certainly, before any survey is sent out, allow the parents to have a first look to see what, what's going on. Um, and then I don't know if you could do it ahead of time. You know, there are, the time windows are always so short on those that you could, uh, you know, you could allow those parents to also, you know, give some feedback. But um, I don't think we should be fishing for our children's information and our children's parents' information without, without permission. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, we do the, in all fairness, there, there is an option to, to opt out of these surveys. Um, and yeah, as a matter of just kind of almost reflexively, I, I, I kind of conveyed to my wife, yeah, no, let's opt out, right? Um, but it's not, the way that I actually believe that this should operate is that there should be an opt-in, not an opt-out, mm -hmm. right? Why is it incumbent on us to have to, on parents to have to, you know, proactively ask that our children not participate in these things rather than request that they do. Again, we can have that discussion, you know. Having said that, and, and I touched on this in, in the, the Carmel Education Foundation video as well, I, I'd like to understand the data. Like, what's the, what data is being collected? For what purpose, right? How is it being secured? How is it being reported? Does each parent get the ability to see at a granular level how their children responded? Do they get a full report of that survey? And what is the purpose yes. of that data, both on an individual level per student and on an aggregate level as, 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 a, as a student body moving forward? You know, I always say to my med students, like, start with the why. You know, ask yourself, why are you ordering that test? Because you need to understand what you're going to do when that test comes back one way versus another. And oftentimes, the best thing you do is not order the test because you don't know what you're going to do with the data that you get from the test, and it's not going to be beneficial or impactful to the patient's care. So, you know, before we go, go broadly surveying our children, but you, utilizing outside third-party platforms that with questions that are being written by outside third-party, you know, folks that, that have nothing to do with our community, I think we need to ask ourselves, what is the purpose of collecting this data and, mm -hmm. and, and what are we going to do with the results? Is it going to mean that some kids qualify for certain programs and others don't? Is it going to mean that some children get extra attention when it comes to their belief systems that, that others perhaps potentially, you know, are deemed to not you know, uh, to not be a necessity? Does it mean that we're trying to identify at-risk kids? Maybe it is, and maybe that's fine. And, you know, but, but I do think that it's important that we have a holistic understanding as to the, the reason behind why we're choosing to try to collect this data about our community's children, but then more importantly, how do we tend to secure that data? And what do we intend yes. to do with it? You know? Yeah. So, so, well so again, being yeah. on the outside, uh, it's very difficult to know that. But if we're elected, um, I do think it should be a priority that we go and, and, and better understand. And that's not, I'm not saying that we would throw this all out. Maybe there's some good things there. But I think it's yeah. important that the board understands it. And I think it's important that the board shares that understanding perspective with the community and the parents. And then we, we collectively as a community decide if this is what we want for our children. Can, can I add to that too? I, he's made a really good point about what's the purpose. And I think fa families get really busy with life. You know, you've got kids and you've got programs and you've got work and laundry and all these things coming at you. So, you, you know, a, a survey sounds innocuous, you know, it's just a survey, you know, how harmful could that be? But um, 
what I noticed, I've gone to most of the board meetings since uh, last December, just to get a feel for what it's all about and how it works, who the players are. And I noticed they stay at a really high level. There's a, there's presentations by the staff to the board and they listen to the very nice presentations and they, they shower accolades about how good a, things are going. I would like to, I think we're all three of us talking about bringing real leadership to the board where we are proactive. We're saying, okay, we wanna have a presentation on the surveys and ask the questions like that. Like what? Why? You know, why are we asking questions about the, the ethnic or the uh, the nature of the family? And if the children are talking to their parents or about current events and racial uh, inequities, you know, uh, why why are we asking these questions? So I think, you know, as representatives of parents, um, we need to be proactively leading the board, not sitting there watching presentations at a very high level. You know, like we talked a minute ago about the performance of individual schools. Well, they didn't show that. You know, they show an aggregate yeah. level and it really dilutes what's really going on. So yeah, I, I, I think when we talk about school improvement plans and just I wanted to kind of circle back on earlier discussion before we uh, uh, might miss it. But um, there's a plan that says students will be able to engage in work to develop social justice advocacy skills. Um, and it's to, they want to develop lessons to blend into SEL curriculum in, er, in the areas of social justice and equity. So we're talking about the students. So you think, okay, so we want to make social justice advocacy uh, uh, skills or provide those to our children. So you ask yourself, okay, what, what grades are we talking about? Is that the high school? No. Is that, are we talking about the middle schools? No. This is at one of the elementary schools. So what the highest grade is, is you know, we're talking about 10 year olds, you know, the right. oldest there. So we're, we're dealing with those kinds of things at that and, level. And who defines what social justice yeah. advocacy means? Yeah. Uh, what are the issues that, that, are, that are decided are important to impose on our children to care about? Yeah, so, so we're talking, you know, uh, Media, the oldest kid in that school is 10 years old. They haven't even had civics. They haven't had all the history that you get in the middle schools and the high schools. But yeah, we're, we're already uh, indoctrinating them about uh, where they need to go out and become social activists on things they haven't even processed. Their brains aren't even fully developed yet. So Right. They're imparting their belief system on them. Yeah. 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 And and like it's like you beautifully said. In your piece, they're they're turning them into social activists, and and instead of focusing what their core mission is, is to teach them academics, to right, help right. them thrive, and eventually get jobs someday. I mean, yep. I, I hate to say it, but basically that's what a school is for, and they've lost <laughs> they've lost their focus on their primary mission. And okay. and I don't want to lose sight of one more thing because I was actively involved in this early on with understanding the panorama survey. I I became I, I became aware that when they gathered those surveys and sent those off to the third party, that there was no and I know this from 30 years in business, and Greg, you're probably going to know this from your IT background. Normally, you have, when you share with a third party, a privacy agreement that says you will keep this information protected and will not share this information other than for which it's intended to summarize this and share back with us, Carmel Play Schools. There was no okay. such privacy agreement. Uh, between Panorama and and Carmel Clay Schools. I mean, that just blows my mind. So that means they that Carmel Clay Schools could share all of the underlying data with Panorama. Panorama could sell it to anybody that they wanted. And that to me is a complete eradication of all fiduciary responsibility. I mean, it is terrible, terrible what they did. And they've got it all the way down to the granular level of data for our kids. 
in Carmel Clay schools. It's terrible. Um, so I hope when you're elected that someone will investigate that and 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 bring an end to that. So we've moved past the point in time when parents and citizens can sit idly by and assume that everything that goes on inside the schools is in the best interest of the child. You've all mentioned this. Parents have to reclaim their role as the chief educator of their children and realize that in order to help their children thrive requires inquiring, listening, investigating, and you know, even sometimes it might require challenging. So as we close out our time together, in one sentence from each of you, what advice would you give the citizens of Carmel as they go to the voting booths? Okay. Um, well, I would ask them first and foremost to, to do their diligence. Um, you know, I, I still believe in a, in a, in a free society where, where people have the choice to decide uh, when, they, when they choose their elected representatives um, whether or not those folks that they're voting for uh, reflect their own perspectives and, and, and let that be what guides their choice. So, you know, do your diligence, look at our website, um, reach out to us if you have questions, um, attend a, a meet and greet if you'd like to interact with us one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Um, and then equally do the diligence on, on the other folks that are running, understand um, what their positions are, understand um, how they're being promoted. Um, we are very grassroots. We, you know, we, we, of course we have support um, from folks that are like-minded to us, but we have built this campaign internally. What we are, uh, <laughs> there, there's a lot of slanderous commentary out there that somehow we are an extension of other organizations. State for the record, it's not true. Um, we we truly do have the ability to do this on our own. Uh, that, that might, maybe that came as a surprise to some people. Um, and you know, but understand as much as as somehow you know, at times folks want to say that we are somehow um, being reflective of, of larger or, or other organizations that are trying to impose their will. It goes both ways. Take a look at the other side and the folks as to who's supporting them. And, and the belief systems of those individuals and institutions that are getting behind them, those political action committees, those types of things, and make an informed decision. It's like I said earlier, Vicki, our, our objective is to give this community a choice. And you know, the community will decide and we will live with that decision. Um, there will be ramifications uh, in, in either direction of that decision. Um, I think we'll lose more students from our system. Um, I think that that'll be unfortunate because those who can afford alternative options will pursue them. And those that, that can't will in some ways be left behind. Um, yeah. that, that would make me very sad to see happen. Um, but yeah, you know, reach out, be educated and vote, um, vote in, a, in, a, in a way that reflects your own perspectives as, and, and the, the degree to which you agree with, with ours versus those other candidates that are running. Excellent. Thanks, Adam. Well, and I, I think your vote this year may be the most important vote mm. for a school board yep. in the history of Carmel. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And we've got two mm. ways to go. One yeah. could keep it or return us to a basic, healthy foundational education for our children to flourish now and in the future. Or it could um, it could sort jettison to even adopt more. Um, progressive elements that would actually harm our students and divide them from really truth and maybe divide families and, and also um, make a negative impact on our community. Excellent, Jenny. Thank you. Yeah, yeah well said. Um, very well said. Just to add on what they both said, you know, we are very, very like-minded and um, uh, so I concur with what they just uh, went through, but we, it's important to keep in mind that we are very long-term residents. Collectively, we've been in Carmel over a hundred years. And uh, I really find when I explain this, what we're, why we're running and what we're running for to uh, residents as I've been out canvassing, 
I tell them that we're really, uh, it's a moderate platform we're talking about. We're talking about focusing on, on academics. And when we have controversial value oriented things, that should stay in the domain of the family. This does not belong in the classroom. Um, and I just add lastly that there, there's three districts uh, in Carmel, three school districts, and there's five positions on the school board. So this is like Jenny said, a really important election. Uh, there's three, we have three candidates, one in each district. And what's unusual in Carmel is you get to vote for one candidate in each district. So you have very, very powerful, you get three votes. And if we get the majority, we can really make a difference. Uh, we can turn the ship back where it was. Like Jenny said, that we'll just, we're talking about uh, you know, uh, academic focused thing, uh, agenda, and that we don't have uh, anything else going on in the classrooms other than uh, education and teachers are supported and teachers are not consumed with other activities or diluted, diluting their time that they're able to focus uh, on the classroom on subjects How about that. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very good. I, I am just so grateful for your time and I appreciate all that you're doing. And uh, I, I'll be getting this out in the next day or two. Uh, to all of our uh, Corpus Christi for Unity and Peace supporters and out on Facebook as well. I just, I wish you all well. And, um, and, and I, I hope too that the attacks diminish. You know, you, you know that you're doing a good job when the attacks are happening. <laughs> just keep it positive, folks. Keep it positive because yeah. you know what? If if they're going to attack, let them do that. You know that the goodness is on your side. Just remember that. Okay. All right. Have a great day. Thank you, Thanks, Nikki. Nikki. Appreciate your Thank time. You. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.